Look, uh, there's a Politico investigation that's uh, that's doing the rounds, that's making a lot of headlines, that says multiple MPs have used parliamentary trips abroad as an opportunity to use sex workers or for raucous, excessive drinking. Look, I'm not going to ask you to name names, although feel free. Uh, but, um, <laughs> look, this, I mean, this is sort of astonishing. I mean, the, the MPs using sex workers on official trips abroad, this is, this is, this is not good, <laughs> he says, vaguely doesn't come as a surprise, really? sadly. I mean, the stories that we've heard over the years. I mean, the, the thing I think it's important to kind of explain to listeners is, I mean, there is a lot that we cannot report as journalists mm. uh, because there's a legal threshold uh, to, that we have to apply to uh, whether or not we can report these stories. You, you mean you mean you, you mean you see stuff, you think you know stuff, but you you can't stand it up to a legal threshold exactly. so these things go unreported? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there is a, there is a, a one particular MP uh, who is known to be extremely notorious mm. on foreign trips, but not just in terms of sex workers, but their own MP colleagues, uh, yeah. where this kind of behaviour, uh, inappropriate sexual behaviour, has gone on. I understand that that's been reported to the party uh, repeatedly over a number of years. Uh, it's never been substantiated, but, you know, in some ways, you know, often where there is smoke, there is fire. Yeah. But, you know, we also have to obviously uh, reach certain thresholds to be able to report this kind of material if we're particularly if we're going to name names and actually you know it, it, whilst it's great kind of salacious detail you know there's a serious point behind this which is this kind of behavior ought to be called out yeah. it is inappropriate it wouldn't be tolerated in any other uh, workforce in the country um and, and therefore you know we should be trying as often as we can to report this with as much detail as mm. we can and actually name and shame these individuals and in some ways I, you know, we do report stories without naming MPs often, um, but there's a premium that comes to be able to tell the real story because actually that's the only way that we're going to see a culture shift. At the moment, if we just report stories saying that this terrible behaviour goes on and it goes unchallenged or it goes unreported or it goes, um, you know, unpunished, uh, then it almost perpetuates the problem yeah. because they think they can get away with it. It, it norm but, normalises it. But I mean, worst. the things I can tell you, yes, prostitutes coming on to, you know, the terrace in Westminster, uh, that's, that's a, a frequent story that we hear. Gosh. You know, parties involving drugs um, that, you know, even very senior House of Commons officials are aware of. You know, drugs being pulled on, uh, sold in the parliamentary estate. We've heard all about that in the past. I mean, the stories that you hear, there are more stories that you hear mm. than you could ever possibly report. See, I, I think the public often struggles to understand, and it's not their fault because they're not necessarily, you know, trained in media law, the idea that we can sort of talk here and now about these kinds of stories without naming names. They've been, well, why, why do you get to know the names and we don't get to know the names? But this is this is a sort of a, a constant bane of political journalism, right? It is. I mean, and also, you know, for, for, for fairness and for balance, we have to remember that there's always two sides to, mm -hmm. to every story. There are certain uh, things that people say which may be motivated by, you know, <laughs> not necessarily genuine uh, concerns. Mm. So, you know, it, it is a minefield when you're reporting these kind of issues to do with either sexual impropriety, bullying, uh, all of those kind of things, because, uh, you know, people make claims for all sorts of reasons. But it does come down to, I think, one of the kind of central points that we've returned to time and time again when we've been reporting on this kind of behaviour, which is that the House of Commons does not have a HR function, yeah. which basically means that MPs are their own bosses and they're also the bosses of their staff. They don't have any real recourse uh, to complain about things. They can go to the party. Sometimes they don't want to do that mm. because they think that that might have an impact on them losing them jobs. You know, they don't necessarily want to go to the ICGS, which is the body that was set up by the House of Commons for complaints of this nature. Because again, they often wonder whether it will get taken seriously enough, uh, who, who will be informed about um, the complaint. Uh, obviously, the complainant themselves have to respond it means that if that's your boss that can make your working conditions very difficult so there are numerous reasons why uh, it's particularly fraught uh, yeah. in this in this particular you know in this particular workplace